I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. PBS Books and the Institute of Museum and Library Services are partnering on Visions of America, all stories, all people, all places. August's conversation commemorates the 75th anniversary of the desegregation of the armed forces. Well, led by IMLS Director Crosby Kemper, scholars Matthew Delmont and Jeffrey Sammons, as well as Brigadier General Terry Williams, they explore the important role that people of color played in the armed forces in American history. To see the conversation, go to visionsofamerica.org. Well, today we have a treat. We are speaking as part of the promotion of the Visions of America third virtual conversation with Matthew Delmont. He is the author of the acclaimed Half American, the epic story of African Americans fighting World War II at home and abroad. We are so excited to have him here today to discuss his book. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, Heather. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so glad that you were here to discuss your book. Can you share a little bit about your book and where the name came from? So the book is about what World War II looked like from the Black perspective. The title of the book comes from a letter that a man named James G. Thompson wrote to the Pittsburgh Courier in 1941. It was December of 1941, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And Thompson, who was a 26-year-old from Wichita, Kansas, had a lot on his mind at the time. He was wondering what it would mean for him and other Black Americans to be drafted into a segregated military. So he writes this letter to the Pittsburgh Courier, which was the largest and most influential Black newspaper at the time. And it's a powerful, dynamic letter. It asks in part, should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Is the America I know worth defending? And that phrase, should I sacrifice my life to live half American, it really stuck with me. And it's why I chose Half American as the title of the book. The Pittsburgh Courier used Thompson's letter to launch what was called the Double Victory Campaign, which became the rallying cry for Black Americans during the war. Because Black Americans saw themselves as fighting two wars at the same time. They were fighting both to defeat fascism abroad, but also to defeat racism at home. They recognized it wasn't enough to win the war militarily if they came home to racism and white supremacy at home. So the book, Half American, tries to tell that entire story. It looks at what the war looked like from the Black perspective. It starts before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, traces the vast contributions that more than a million Black Americans made to helping win the war. And then it talks about what it meant for Black veterans to come home and just keep fighting, that they had to keep fighting for civil rights once they came home after the war. So how did you get the idea for this book? So this book actually grew out of my last book project, which was a project called Black Quotidian, in which I looked at uh, African-American newspapers, papers like the Pittsburgh Courier and Chicago Defender. I was looking at historical newspapers, to try to understand how Black communities experience history as it unfolded. When I was looking at those papers from the 1930s and 1940s, I kept coming across stories about World War II. Particularly from the 1940s, I saw all of these pictures and anecdotes and stories about some of the more than a million Black men and women who were drafted or volunteered to serve in the military during World War II. And these weren't famous people. These were average Black Americans from Minneapolis, from Chicago, from Cleveland, from New York. Um, and seeing these stories, first I, see, I saw a dozen of them and eventually hundreds and hundreds of them. It made me curious because, you know, I'm a historian, I'm a teacher. I've taught about this topic in the classroom for more than a decade, but I'd never seen this many examples of Black Americans serving their country during World War II. And so it was really that curiosity from that last project that led me to start the research that became this project on World War II, Half American. It's really extraordinary. Throughout your book, it seems that you're, you're saying that without the contributions of African Americans in World War II, the war would have been lost. In what roles did African Americans play in World War II? So it's like one of my favorite things about being a historian is that you get surprised when you do the research. And so at the start of this research, maybe seven years ago, I had no idea that I'd be making this argument that Black Americans were absolutely vital to helping America and the Allies win the war. But when you actually get into the records, look at the military records, look at the um, anecdotes and the, the recollections of, of officers and enlisted personnel and war correspondents at the time, it becomes really clear that not only were Black Americans there in vast numbers, but they were playing really essential roles that helped America and the Allies win. I think the best example of this would be a group called the Red Ball Express. They were a group of, group of truck drivers, a Black uh, truck convoy, who helped move goods after the D-Day invasion. I think most Americans are familiar with D-Day, June 6, 1944. 
But D-Day just stood for date of the invasion. There was still D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two. And it was really the weeks and months after the invasion that turned the tide of the war. It turns out that Black Americans were absolutely vital to that stage of the war because they were the ones who were loading the ships that crossed the channel. They unloaded those ships, then they loaded trucks and drove those trucks across France and eventually into Germany. That Red Ball Express truck driver group moved 400,000 tons of ammunition, food, and fuel across France into Germany. So it made it possible for the Allied forces to move as quickly as they did and to keep the, the Nazis uh, on their heels. The reality is that Black Americans were the the backbone, the foundation of the Allies' supply effort. Um, it's not the glamorous story we usually tell about World War II, but it was the story about how the war was won. Part of the argument that the book makes is that World War II wasn't just a battle of strategy and will, it was a battle of supply. And when you understand it from that perspective, the really important contributions that Black troops made become all the more apparent. What were some of the challenges that, th that African-Americans who were contributing that they faced at home and especially abroad. It's important to remember that the entirety of the military was racially segregated during World War II. Uh, at the start of the war, the Marine Corps doesn't allow any Black Americans to serve at all. It's not until late 1942 that the Marine Corps has the first cohort of Black Marines called the Montford Point Marines. And so racism, discrimination were part of the day-to-day -day experience of Black men and women who served in the military during World War II. And it was true both while they're still training in the United States and when they deploy. Um, one of the, the sources of research I drew from were a number of letters that were written by Black soldiers to the NAACP, to Thurgood Marshall, who's the lead lawyer for the NAACP at the time. And these were Black soldiers who were stationed on military training bases in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. And they were describing the kind of violence and harassment they experienced, both on base from white officers and enlisted men, and then when they were in town by white policemen and, and sheriffs and white townspeople. Things got so bad, they said they feared for their lives. And in some cases, Black troops were actually killed here in the United States while they're training to fight the war. These Black troops who wrote the letters said that they literally feared for their lives. They felt like they're at war here in the United States. They mm -hmm. said they feel safer once they deploy to the European theater or the Pacific theater than they felt here in the United States. And so one of the things the book tries to do is bring that reality to the foreground. I think it's easy to talk about the history of World War II sometimes and talk about this period of national unity. In some ways, the United States was unified during World War II, but it was also a very fraught time period. Um, racism, racial discrimination, racial violence was everywhere in the United States during World War II. And it's important when we talk about the history that we're able to tell those two stories together. The stories of the military courage, the bravery, the amazing things that military service men and women are able to do, but also the fact that these black military men and women, they're doing those amazing feats while also um, fighting, in some cases, fighting for their lives, fighting for freedom here in the United States, both during and after the war. So in your book, you share stories. Um, and I was wondering if you could share a, a few of the names that probably people recognize some of the stories that you share in your book. Yeah. So two of the short stories I would share, one would be Doris Miller who's perhaps the best known black American to serve in World War II. He was one of the heroes of Pearl Harbor. Doris Miller was a young mess attendant from Waco, Texas, who was on the West Virginia. And again, it's important to remember the only role black men could take on these Navy ships at the start of the war was as mess attendants, where they essentially waited on white officers. They did the cooking and cleaning on the ships. So that's what Doris Miller's job was. Yet when the bombing started at Pearl Harbor, he performed heroically. He helped attend to the wounds of wounded men on his ship. He went above deck. He made a makeshift stretcher to move his captain to a safer spot in the deck. And then when his officer orders him to go to one of the anti-aircraft guns, Miller goes over there and starts firing at the Japanese planes that are circling overhead, potentially hitting and downing one of them. It was an amazing story. And it really galvanizes Black Americans all across the country because they're saying, look, if you just give us the opportunity to participate in combat, we have the ability to be brave. We have the ability to be courageous. We just need the opportunity. So Miller's story is one of those that the book tries to bring to the foreground. It's also important that Miller isn't the only Black mess attendant. There was another young man named uh, Julius Ellsbury who actually lost his life at Pearl Harbor. He was just 20 years old. He was on the USS Oklahoma. And he was the first person, black or white, to be killed from Birmingham, Alabama during the war. His picture was posted all across businesses and homes in black Birmingham with the phrase, remember Pearl Harbor. And so by trying to foreground those stories of Doris Miller, Julius Ellsbury, it tries to give readers today a clearer sense of how black Americans experienced these iconic pivotal moments in our nation's history, that they were 
absolutely invested in helping win the war, but they were telling different kinds of stories as the war was unfolding. So you've alluded to some of this already, but I wanted to talk about the the disparities that your your book discusses when African Americans and servicemen return home after the war. Um, they don't have access to GI bills, to home loans, to other benefits that white veterans had access to. Can you discuss that further? And can you also talk about if they did receive recognition and when for their service? So one of the important and challenging parts of telling this story from the black perspective is that the war doesn't really end in 1945. Yes, the military victories are complete, but that whole generation of black veterans comes back and they just keep fighting. In this case, they're fighting for civil rights, fighting for freedom, fighting for democracy here in the United States. They're fighting for voting rights. They're fighting to be able to live their lives safely. Um, there were numerous cases of violence against Black veterans, and the book details those. And it gives us a, a much clearer understanding of what the what the context of the post-war period looked like for those Black veterans. But as you're asking, in terms of policy, Black veterans disproportionately were unable to benefit from the GI Bill benefits in the same way that white veterans were. Of course, the GI Bill was essentially America's reward or repayment to that generation of veterans. It's what enabled a whole generation of white veterans to be able to move into the middle class because it provided access to low interest home mortgages, access to college tuition benefits, um, loans to be able to start businesses. It really it enabled social mobility for a whole generation of white veterans. By and large, though, black veterans weren't able to participate in that. And that was really by design. As this legislation was being drafted, it's um, determined by primarily white Southern congressmen that it's going to be um, distributed at the state and local level as opposed to the federal level. And everyone at the time understands what that means. If you do things at the state level in 1945, it means there's going to be discrimination based on state policies. And that's what happens. Black veterans try to access these benefits, but they're generally given the runaround or they're denied benefits or given a more watered down version of them. There's a group of economists at Brandeis University that's calculated what the long-term impact and cost of this discrimination was. And what they found is there's about a $100,000 gap between what white veterans were able to get from these benefits from World War II and what black World War II veterans were able to get. And when we think about the vast racial wealth gap in the country, a large part of that can be traced back to the GI Bill and the discrimination that was written into it. That's extraordinary. It's very interesting. And I'm glad your book is, and, and you're able to share all of this information with us. Can you discuss what events led to Truman signing Executive Order 9981? So it's another important part of the story is that Black Americans had been fighting to desegregate the military well before the start of World War II. And, and that uh, activism really escalates before and during the war. And it continues after the war. And thankfully, by 1948, President Truman signs an executive order that desegregates the military. There are a few factors that come together to really encourage President Truman to do that. Uh, one is black political power. He recognizes the activism that's been going on in the decade prior to 1948, and he feels compelled by it. He recognizes that black voters, black activists are going to be an increasingly important political voice, particularly for the Democratic Party. And so he sees in key swing states in the North and the Midwest, black voters are going to be um, playing a much larger role in determining who gets elected. And that's one of the things that influences President Truman to make this choice. A second is President Truman was a veteran. He served in World War I, and he is deeply impacted by the, the violence that Black veterans encountered at the end of World War II, particularly the story of Isaac Woodard, who was a veteran of the Pacific Theater, trying to get home to his family in South Carolina, who was beaten so badly by a, a white sheriff, they actually lost his eyesight. His, his eye was essentially gouged out by the, the sheriff's nightstick. That sent shockwaves all across the country, and it um, horrified President Truman. He was shocked and aghast that this kind of violence could happen in America to Black veterans who had just served their country. And so that sense of, of moral outrage influenced Truman as well. And then the third factor was the, the Cold War reality of what America was doing and competing with internationally in the years after World War II. America wants to present itself to the world, particularly to these newly independent nations and the nations that are fighting for independence. America wants to present itself as a beacon of freedom and democracy. But it's really hard to do that when you condone segregation, including in your military. And so part of the calculus that Truman's making is that um, the desegregation of the military is one thing that was under his control. A lot of other things he had to get legislation passed through Congress that, given the dynamics of the time, just wasn't feasible. But he could sign an executive order that would lead to the desegregation of the military, and that would take a step towards making America an 
more democratic country so that as it's trying to uh, extol itself, extol its virtues internationally, compete with the Soviet Union, it would have a, a stronger foundation to be able to stand on. So you were here because we were discussing the, the 75th anniversary of the desegregation of the military. And I just want to underscore how important your book is and, and the timing. I mean, it, it, it came out last year. Is that correct? That's right. It came out last October. Um, and already it's just it's so many people have just said so many brilliant things about it. So I just want to thank you for taking the time. But also before we close, I just want to ask, is there anything that you'd like to share? Because I think every author has a big takeaway they want their readers to understand. And if you had to pick one takeaway, what would that takeaway be? It'd be the same thing I tell my students in the classroom all the time, that the stories we tell about the past matter and say it's truer today than it ever has been. It's important to be able to reckon honestly with our nation's history. And I think this book hopefully does part of that. The reality of World War II is that it was a very fraught time period. The stories I tell in the book are stories of bravery and courage that should be uplifting and inspiring, but they're also stories of racism and violence that should be very troubling. Both those parts are, are true parts of our nation's history, that this book is fully American history with Black Americans put at the center of it. And it's a story that I hope all Americans are able to read, discuss, and reckon with honestly. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. To learn more, please pick up Half American so you can engage more with this really important educational content. In addition, we hope that you will go to pbsbooks.org to watch our Visions of America virtual conversation, which delves into the 75th anniversary of the desegregation of the military with a great conversation with Matthew Delmont, Professor Jeffrey Sammons, Brigadier General Terry Williams, and IMLS Director Crosby Kemper. Until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.